Once again, welcome. Glad to see you. Today I'll get started with, well, showing you, of course, as you can see, video one and two, like part one and two online, and three, two, even from last week, of course. But today I'll begin with a slight bit, a slight talk about link building. One of you asked me a bit about link building last time, and I'm going to briefly touch upon the subject, which is very diverse, but then again, it's actually not that complicated. It just takes a lot of it just takes a lot of time. Sadly, there's no shortcut. But then again, that's how life is. There are no shortcuts to anything. Link building is basically the concept of getting other websites to link to, like get, yeah, get people to your website by people following links. Well, that's the name kind of says it. And why is that important? Well, if other websites link to you, that first of all means there's a chance that visitors, real human visitors, are going to follow those links and visit your website. Maybe read some stuff and interact with your website, which is good, because you've got your message across. The other part of that is when another links, website links to you, search engines like Google, especially Google. I'm not certain about some of the more obscure ones. But, uh, yeah, especially the Russian. The Russian ones, they are very strange. But uh, Google, they basically rank a site. They, 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 you know Google and uh, some, uh, some websites are high on the, on the list if you search for a keyword and some are lower. One of the ways they get that, get that rank list is because is by watching who links to what which websites. As I mentioned, all those search uh, search company search engine companies they have tiny robots crawling around the net and trying to well basically index all of the internet. But then again, and so of course it's important to get your site linked because then the bot can follow you follow, get to your website and index it. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter, well, if there's a link or not, you will follow it, but some links are worth more than others. Because, well, you know, like humans, when some people say something, you, you trust it very much, but when some other people say basically the same thing, you wouldn't trust this as much. I mean, hopefully, if your teacher says something, you. You consider that a source of knowledge and trust because you know they should know their stuff. Whereas if you ask a random stranger on the street about some subject, let's say about the economy, the chances are you probably wouldn't, tr hopefully wouldn't trust that stranger on the street as much as your teacher who has studied the economy for 20 years and worked with it for 20 years. Hopefully that wouldn't be so, who hopefully it would be so at least. That's basically, that's the idea behind yeah, an internal secret rank, which basically no one knows. But we know Google rank websites on a, on a scale of, and probably everyone else, ranks websites on a scale of, well, trustworthiness. So of course some websites are more trustworthy about the content than something else, some, than some else. For example, take a subject that probably a lot of, uh, some of you have heard about, yeah, uh, the DK, the Danish newscaster, hopefully should have a higher trustworthiness when it comes to being, yeah, when it comes to news than the Corda Vis, which is far right and very, and to be honest, rather racist in its human point, in its coverage of the news. So that would be an example of a, hopefully, it's a source that ranks pretty high in the trustworthiness when it comes to bringing news, and a source that doesn't, shouldn't, at least shouldn't rank as high when it comes to news. So basically, website, you know, Google does rank websites on a scale of trustworthiness. What does that matter to you? Well, A, you of course want to, your website to be trustworthy, we'll get to that in a moment, and B, if a trustworthy website, a website which is considered trustworthy, has a link to you, then that, that link has a higher 
well, let's call it trust value, than if some obscure website that is, hasn't been verified for its quality of content links to you. Which is, why, which is why link building is important. It's important to get people or get places that have a high trust to link to you. For obvious reasons, because if you, if uh, trustworthy sources link to you, not only does it bring visitors, and hopefully sites that are trustworthy do have a large clientele, but if someone trustworthy links to you, some of that trust rubs off on the on your on the judgment of yours, rubs off on the judgment of your side. So basically, they both by having a link from a trustworthy so a source, your site gets a vote of confidence from someone. So it's not important who is uh, not exactly unimportant who links to you. It's actually rather important because good link, good good sources that link to you are worth a lot more than uh, well, not as trustworthy sources. Just a second. Okay. Just a second. Just need to move that plug from my computer. So it good. Now we don't risk it going out during the presentation. Good. And that's why link building is important. It's important to think about who links to you. And thus, link building is very important for SEO. And there's a lot of technical stuff about how to put your links properly. And there's some guys I'm going to link to you. So the important thing is basically building relationships with the websites, because a strong relationship inside a subject gets your site a high rank. And, the, and but how do you get others to link to you? That's probably one of the next big things. You're considering I'm putting the links to these tutorials online afterwards. Well, just getting others to links to you—that's pretty easy. I mean, that's last time I mentioned the thing about spam bots, crawling over the net and putting spam com spam comments with links to. Uh, usually dubious websites who want to sell something in your comment section of random unprotected WordPress sites. What they're doing is pretty much like taking a, a shotgun and, well, with, you know, those bullets that put out a lot of shrapnel. That's what they're doing. They're trying to cover everything with links to that, well, website. And that's why they're spamming all over the net so they can get more links to the, the website. That's one tactic. Basically spread your link, the links to your site as much as possible. That's not a very, that's not very good linking, link building. Actually, nowadays, Google punish people who, do, who use that tactic, which actually luckily has, redu has uh, reduced the amount of spam because that tactic's not effective anymore, so the spammers don't use as much as they did a couple of years ago. So, you don't, so it's not just the amount of links because, like I said, the links need to come from trustworthy sources and good sources. So just not, do, of course, spread your links as much as, link to your website as much as possible, but not everywhere, per se. Do take into account where you post it. Or, especially don't use bots to, don't pay companies who use bots to spread links to your website. That will get your website downgraded. So how do you get others to link it? Well, the most important thing, and that's in general the most important thing for SEO actually, Google does uh, write good quality content. Like I mentioned last time, the search companies actually try and rank the quality of your content. Of course, one of the ranks, one of the influences of the rank is if others link to your content, because then that's a word of confidence if others refer to you Basically, like writing a paper, of course, if others refer to a, someone, it's considered it's a vote of trust. Lack of quality, but that's the important. That's so, write quality content. And in that, there's a chance that you get others to use you as a source because you've written some quality content. 
But how should they find that? Well, that's the hard thing. It's hard to get started. But you need to write some quality content and then write something that write some content that others find interesting. Because if you lure people to you to your website once, for example, you, let's say you posted your link to Facebook and some networks and some forums and so on, and people began seeing your website, seeing that part uh, with that article because it's good. Then your site is going upwards in rank, and then that one article basically has a positive influence on the whole rank of your whole domain and your whole website. So post, uh, write some quality content, get it linked to, and then of course in the future keep one writing new quality content. And how do you? And how, but how? And then it, but even so, maybe people wouldn't want to wouldn't visit your website at first. A good way, at least if you are having a website that's a bit more blog centric, or where you write have articles. Well, it'll probably hurt a bit to take one of your articles written for your website which you love very much and at least and post some of it or post something on a different website. Guest blog is actually a good way to spread the word about you, both you as a person. Actually that might come as a shock for some of you. Google does rank you as a person too. Are you a trustworthy person or not? Who knows? Google, Google does, or at least they pretend they do. Actually, every people who has a good Google account has a certain level of trust. So, of course, if you are known for writing good quality article, articles because you posted articles to known pages, then your yeah, name, brand, personal brand, so to say, carry over, carries over to your own website. And, of course, if you write a guest article somewhere else, which, gets, which is popular, then, of course, you can... Uh, of course, ask the owner of that website, but then you can also use that web article, that, that guest article, and put a link back to your own website. Again, you're, uh, you're having a guest article on a popular website. That links to your website. The good, the good value of that website drops off on your own. So, taking a step back and actually considering writing for, some, writing for someone else, of course, within the area of expertise that your website covers, is actually a good idea because it benefits you in many ways, both on your personal brand, but also you get a chance to link to your website and print this. Yeah, and in general, write content, get your list on, get your website on some mailing lists that links to you. That's also important. If submit your blog to some. RSS feeds are similar. If there are some big, some uh, yeah. directories are similar where the websites on your content is linked to, of course, especially quality dictionaries. Try to get your website on those dictionaries. For example, we talked last time. I talked about a website selling dog food. Maybe I don't know. I'm not a dog owner myself. I'm more of a cat person. But let's say you have a website selling dog food and have some articles about how to take care of your dog on your website. Try to get try to get in contact with, for example, Dance Kennel Club, the club for people breeding dogs in Denmark. Try to get in contact with them. If maybe you could, you maybe you can be allowed to have an put a post a ghost uh, guest article on their website. Or at least maybe they would want to they probably have a link of Recommended dealers and recommend and recommended sources for the info about dogs and so on. Try to uh, get into their dictionaries about dogs because that's uh, okay. That's probably that should have a pretty high trust rank on the area subject area of dogs in Danish. And then again, of course, if you want to, if you're talking about. An international website, it's a bit harder because then you need to find international trustworthy sources. It's always easier to try to target a specific market than target an int international one. And, but then again, that's pretty much the same no matter what media you're using or what area you're working in. Advertisement. And, well, I'll post these guides to link building and uh, 
so to say there's not there's a, a lot more to it than what I said here but then again it's not that much different from what I said it is basically right the main thing for getting, getting links to your website is right is spread your website as much as much as possible without it being annoying like those spam bots and do write con quality content that would that 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 gets others others to link to your website especially that's important having others link to your website also is a trust of brand because then they are personal and then they are maybe if they're linking from another website they are trust rubs, the website's trust drops up off on yours if a person links to you well to be honest who would you rather follow who would you if if uh, you know, if people know you are the owner of a website and you post about it on Facebook all the time, would you follow that link? Or if one of your friends posted about uh, one of your other friends posted about your website on Facebook, would you then rather follow it? Probably he will be more interesting because he's not the owner. People have a tendency to distrust the owner who wants to spread stuff about him, about his project. So. Get your friends to talk about your website. At least they're easier to coerce into talking about it. That still seems a bit more organic, and maybe you, maybe then that will get their friends to talk, and then it spread like, yeah, about yeah, spread virally hopefully. So, quality content that gets people talking about your website and do spread it as much as possible. Use mailing lists and other tools, but beware that just spamming links without any. Yeah, any rhyme or reason does could risk in you getting a lower rank actually. So that was a very brief talk about link building. I've post I'll post those articles. They do summarize it in a bit more detail than one of than what I said here. But it's that's the main thing, and in general, that's the main thing for having websites: right quality quality content content. Keep that as a mantra. Good. The theme for today, which fits nicely into the whole link sharing thing and talking about getting friends to share your website, is social networks. And what can they want to, of course, I don't think I need to get much into detail about what using social networks to share your website can do for you, because basically, that's where people are. I haven't got any concrete numbers, but try to say, try to uh, try to reflect on yourselves. How much time per day do you spend on Facebook? For example, that's the most popular one, and most people are on Facebook. How much time do you spend on Facebook? Whereas, how much time do you spend on other websites? Where's the biggest? What, what would be the way? Would, it, would the biggest chance to see an interesting link be on your face in your Facebook time? Or in your time on other websites. Yeah. Getting your getting your site getting your website shared on social networks like Facebook or Twitter or well maybe that's the two biggest one depending on the region is important because that's where people are. So some kind of social media integration is for you uh, on your website is paramount but then again how many websites nowadays doesn't have some kind of a like this on Facebook button usually most also have some have uh, some else other than uh, Facebook at least Twitter and most also have Google Plus because oh Google like it when you link to Google Plus they do like they do love it when your website links to their their own social network but that's a different matter we'll get to in, into in a moment And I mean, that's why it's good to have a some way of getting people to share, easy, make it easy for people to share. A, 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 of course, you yourself post your content on Facebook. Luckily, there's a, there's some there's plugins for that, so you don't need to pay. Okay, I wouldn't say painstakingly. It's not that hard to copy paste the link and post post a few words about it on Facebook. It's not that it's not hard to spread your thing. It by yourself, for, for example, there are, uh, 
if you have a platform where with a lot of riders, then it would be a lot easier to have your website auto post links to your content to Facebook. When I'm saying Facebook, I'm basically meaning all social networks right now. It's just an euphemism. It's so, I mean, that's what people usually do. I'm pretty sure that the, all the news companies don't sit, don't, they don't pay an intern to sit. Some, oh, no, someone posted a link to a, a new article on, uh, on Newlands Boston. I have to copy that article and put it on Newlands Boston's Facebook page. No, even they don't have the kind of money to pay interns to do that. It would be a waste of time. Of course, there's automated tools for posting stuff to your, to let's say you've made a Facebook page, for example, for your website or for your project. Of course, there's tools for auto posting. They do make life a lot easier. Most of those tools are can also pretty intelligent because the better ones, said some most of them want money to pay, get the really nice uh, features. But if you pay for them, you usually get access to the option of having of uh, delaying a post to Facebook. So you can basically again make a survey, make a get to get to know your user base. If you know your users are most mostly uh, most active on social networks in the afternoon, but you're sitting in your company writing, having you have to work work on you have to uh, update your website in the morning because that's when your company has time for you updating your website. You can actually tell tell those social auto uh, those auto posts to plug in for social media to delay it so that new post new content would new content on your website would uh, first not be posted to the social network immediately, but would be posted to the social network in the afternoon. Many plugins do want money to get that, uh, that rather nice uh, feature though, but there's a lot of options in that area. Yeah. And I mean, I don't really have, uh, okay, just a second. Just had to change the batteries in the microphone, and it is a bit easier on the voice having to uh, using the microphone. As I must admit that you've seen my website here quite a few times because I used it as a demo. And one thing is, of course, having the social network sharing buttons. You can see those on the side here. Because one thing is, you can add social media sharing to your WordPress from and by using plugins. There's a lot of plugins that offers the option to get those floating social media share thing, share buttons, or maybe the plugin allows the option to have your my other website that has them placed in a slightly different, allows you to have your social media sharing buttons at the top of your post or at the bottom of your post. That's nice, you have a, you have a lot of options because by using social media sharing plugins for some others in some sort. I'm not talking about auto posts right now, I'm just talking about having the op having the option of getting those buttons for people to share it on their website. But you don't even need to you don't need to Usually, in the most in many most modern themes, you don't even need to add, add plugins because most themes have those options built in. Those aren't from a those aren't from a plugin. They're just 
basically from the theme. I had originally planned to show you how it looks in the backend of this theme, but I, I'm not going to show you that because I hadn't really thought about it, but of course my secret key to Facebook is is like is embedded in this in the links because this is a live website, so I can't really show you how it looks because then you'll get then you'll get my my val my value. The thing is, you see, with these social media plugins or whatever is it, either it's a plugin or a theme or something, when you have a Facebook page or similar, you get. You can either, but the other process that you, they basically don't need any special codes, but ma ma many of those social media integration do require you to have a developer key for Facebook. That sounds strange. Why do I need to be a developer, registered as a developer for, for Facebook? Well, that's basically because you are going to use what's called, use a slight bit of their servers to link to them. You need the, what's called an API key. And to get that, you need to register yourself as a Facebook developer. Luckily, again, as most things, at least uh, once we're going to this, it's free. So basically, if, you, if you're going to see a plugin or scene that says, hey, you need to link to, link to Facebook, you need an API. Usually, they just uh, link you to the right page from the plugin or theme. Otherwise, you just go. developers at facebook.com you log in with your standard Facebook account and then you can basically get in there and you can see there's a lot of options because most of you most plugins actually just use access to one of these options either by allowed by Facebook so and everything you need to do is I'm not using that website anymore, so I can please be angry. I can show you that. You can see when you uh, when you need to connect your website to Facebook, you got just go to your developer developers.facebook.com and well, if you have a Facebook account, you just get access there. And then when you need to, they you need to make a new project, and then you'll get an app key and app ID, and then you just post that app ID that corresponds to your website on the corresponding social media connection app. Social media app, uh, social media, yeah, plug in for Facebook. So, oops. It's not that hard and it's pretty well described. And most plugins who ask those options are very user friendly. Because they, people do get scared when they, when they hear the word developers. Don't worry, it's rather easy. You just need to. They most plugins do make basically hold your hand while going through how you do that. There's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of social sharing plugins and so on. But like I said, most many themes also come with the option, and there's a lot to do because let's see. Yeah, for example, another option is also you can get plugins that revives old posts. They basically say. Take some of your old content, let's say you've written something three months ago, and then it reposts it to keep it alive, keep it in circulation, so to speak. It's also a way to use social networks, but you just need, you might need the social de the developer Facebook thing to connect to your social media plugin, but don't worry, it's rather, it's rather easy to do. Shouldn't get scared that it says developer. And uh, there's quite a lot of ones. I'm going to link to some articles that show some of them. Some of them are better than others. And some of them are easier to use than others. And basically, what I suggest you do on your website is go to Facebook and make a page for your website. Do not make a user. People used to do that. 
which makes it a bit silly, I think, pretty much, because there are actually uses for the right libraries and universities and so all that are out there. Nowadays, you don't need that. You can you can make it useful for a company actually if you want. That's another that user pattern would look a slightly different than a person user, and then that company could make a page. But usually, you make a what you do would be to make a page for a project, and then you can get whatever social media plug uh, plugin you're using. Most auto post plugins nowadays support posting to pages. So you can say when something's posted on your website, it will put a link to the page just like my website is doing automatically here. That saves you work if it auto posts to Facebook or whatever other network that's used. Another network that's not really that popular in Denmark, it never, Twitter ne never really took off in Denmark, which is globally a bit of an oddball because in other countries Twitter is big. In the U, uh, for example, in the US, people are using, almost using Twitter as much as Facebook. When we all heard about President Trump's Twittering, I mean, at least uh, at the latest with him, uh, Twitter, Twitter became everyday knowledge. Everybody knows Twitter because of President Trump. But there's a lot of other people using Twitter. Twitter is those short messages you send in burst with some com some point of statement or something. But of course, you can also use Twitter to share. A lot of people share, hey, there's something new on my website. A lot of people are following Twitter for that reason. Because p companies will post updates about, hey, we're having a sale. Hey, we are adding a new product to our lineup or similar. That's a good way to use Twitter as your personal knowledge about your project. And of course, you can connect your website to Twitter, so when you post something on your WordPress site, it would be, there would be a link for it on Twitter. And like, as I said, in some countries, Twitter is a lot bigger than Facebook. In, uh, in uh, Asia, yeah, let's just, in Asia, for example, there's, especially in Japan, Twitter dwarfs Facebook by a very large margin. People basically don't use Facebook in Japan. They use Twitter. Their Twitter is the big one. That's, so to, again, in Denmark it's Facebook and most of the Western countries it's Facebook that's the big one. But do a bit of market research. What's the most, po what's the most popular, net net popular network? I'm going to mention a few here, but do some research. Which is the most popular one among your target audience again? For example, Twitter might not be that popular in Denmark, but it's still here and it's mainly used about more about, uh, Twitter is usually used about, uh, among the slight bit more serious people here in Denmark. Another network that's popular, most people don't think of it as on, uh, on it uh, as being a kind of social media, but in many ways it actually is YouTube. Again, it's also First, make a. Do your website carry any sort of video? Do you have any product videos? Make your own. You make your own YouTube channel for your website. Do not put the product video on you on uh, your personal YouTube channel and then link it from the website, because then that's your video, not your project's video. And a lot of people use YouTube. So, putting up short videos and having links back to your website would probably help drive, could help at least, drive traffic back to your website. Fact is, there are pretty much as many searches on YouTube per day as there are searches on Google. So having a presence on YouTube in some sort is, pretty, is a pretty good idea if you want a, a, as a support for your brand. And the probably make some short, uh, if you have a product or something, have some having some short videos and then backlink to your website to get people to get hopefully go onto your website. So having a presence on YouTube is definitely not a bad idea. And then the big back of bear. 
I was about to say the big bad one that many people don't really like and most people actually don't know they have a Google Plus account. But most people do. Basically because Google a couple of years ago forced everyone that has a Gmail account to get a Google Plus account. They didn't ask people, they just made an account for them automatically. So, you probably have one, you're just not very aware of it. Google Plus, for those who don't really don't know it because it's not really that used, Google Plus is school's uh, attempt to make a social network. Basically, we all know Google wants to own the world. It shouldn't be, at least it shouldn't be a, a surprise to anyone. So they, th they saw how popular Facebook was and thought, we can do that too, and then they made Google Plus. It works a slightly bit different way with, than Facebook, but the basic premise is, a, is the same as Facebook. So they want, so, and because nobody was using it, they, for, they more or less uh, forced all Google, Google uh, users to, have, to get an account there. Why am I mentioning this is there aren't many people actively using it. There are some, usually, the people who are a bit more serious about social networking and don't really, and find, say, found, find, and find the endless stream of uh, rants on Facebook and whatnot to be irritating. Usually, uh, some of those people use Google Plus. That's one thing. It has a, sm a, 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 a smaller, but I wouldn't say dedicated, but in a way dedicated uh, target audience. That's there for a reason because they don't like Facebook usually. But uh, other than that, if your website has a Google Plus page, for example, you can see here, some of my websites has yeah what they are called brand accounts. When you have a Google Plus account, you can make sub yeah sub pages or brand accounts under that. Because the reason I'm doing this. Having a presence in Google Plus actually gets you an upvote, gets you a positive vote upwards in Google's ranking of you. Google wants you to use your social network. They don't. So if your website posts its news to Google Plus also, Google like that. They say see that in an especially positive way because hey, you're using our service. Let's give them a thumbs up. So having a presence on Google Plus is actually important because Google want, Google prefers you having you doing that. And we know Google is the most most important search engine, so do as much as we can to get as many small positive upvotes in Google's eye in, uh, in the view of Google. So hang, having a presence on Google Plus is important. You might not personally log into it every day, but Google checks. So at least order post to Google Plus when there's some new content on your website. And make a brand account. I'm not going to into detail how to do that. That would be a different course. I'm just using this to whet your appetite. And as most school, most school services, it is relatively straightforward, and they are trying to hold your hand as much as possible. So if you are not you, if you're not actively using Google Plus, do check it out. There's, it's an okay network, and Google likes that you're using it. Another target audience. And another use is Instagram. Well, Instagram is owned by Facebook. Why not just use why not just use Facebook to share your images? Again, people who come to Instagram and people who use Instagram, they usually have a Facebook account too, but they're using Instagram because they, they want to see pictures about people's projects. They want to see they want to be inspired by what people are doing. Uh, people often post craft videos like one of my friends here who's working with electronics and so on. People post images about uh, interesting stuff to, to Instagram. They don't write rants about whatever or post endless, usually don't post endless cat videos like Facebook feeds sometimes has a tendency to degrade into. Mind you, I do like sweet, I do like cute kittens, but ten, after 10 kittens, kitten videos in a row, it can be a bit, well, repetitive. So people use Instagram in a different way than they use Facebook. But think about it. If you want, if you have a website that is, for example, selling 
try, uh, selling a uh, website that's working with stuff like, well, like I said, at least many of my friends use Instagram to show their craft projects are similar. So if your website is somehow relevant, to, for example, such things, why not connect it to an Instagram account and post images from your from your post on your website on Instagram with their links back to your website? So Instagram is also a good network to use if that fits your target audience's need, the needs of your target audience. That can, of course, everything I'm mentioning here can be auto connected to to your web WordPress blog and made so that your WordPress blog posts to those services. Then, of course, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is serious. You don't have, and maybe you don't. You, maybe the time, maybe the point of your website would not at all align with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, I mean. For example, my website about anime. I don't have that connected in any any way to LinkedIn or to my LinkedIn account because that doesn't fit. That's not the same target. That's not the same goal. On the other hand, my website that's connected to my freelance work that's connected to my LinkedIn account because that makes a lot of sense. If I post about my freelance work, it would get passed on to LinkedIn. So some area, some website, some things would fit a lot, would make a lot of sense to connect with the LinkedIn social network. Some things would not. Don't connect to every social network just because you can, but think which one fits the theme of my website and which one fits my target audiences. Yeah. No. Ah, one of those. Yeah. So it handles everything so you don't have to do it on this quite, Yeah. There's quite there's quite a few of those services actually. I used to use uh, one called Hootsuite, which is pretty much one of the big I think Hootsuite at least it used to be the biggest one of those uh, multi 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 network sharing ones. Hootsuite is nice because it actually has a plugin that plugs right into WordPress so you can connect WordPress to your Hootsuite account and then share it everywhere. But usually you don't actually need those aggregation services. Of course, they make it easier to manage a ton of social network accounts in one place. But if you just want your website to post it, you don't need to have a third party account to post. You can just, have the plug the, just use a plugin on your website and then having it shared. You don't need necessarily need third party accounts. But third-party accounts like the one you mentioned or Hootsuite or similar, they do make it a lot of easier, a lot easier to manage. It's uh, manage, and if social media presence is a very high concern to your website, I would recommend using one of those because they do offer a lot of extra statistics and uh, statistics and, and analyses in one place instead of having to share a uh, check one place instead of having to so instead of having to check well on each of the networks for the, for the statistics. You can check one side, one place if you're using those services. So if social media presence is of paramount importance on your website, I do understand and recommend that you use one of those services. If you just are adding it because it's good to have, but it's not something you're going to want to spend a lot of hours on doing uh, statistics on, then just uh, use some of the plugins that just added into WordPress and then check manually once in a while. On each network to see the statistics. Who's sweet? Yeah, they're from eight. How many million users do they have nowadays? I can't remember exactly. But that is, well, you can see the image here basically can integrate directly into. Into uh, into Facebook, and they have, uh, like I said, auto content scheduling, and a lot of other very nice options. You can basically also, when you're writing a post in there, you can have it posted on one network at some one point and one and another a network at a different time, and yeah, you can schedule it a lot and do a lot of with with you using that service. 
it is pretty good, but then again, well, it's you can get you can use it for free with one. Uh, you can use it for free with a limited amount of accounts and options, and then of course. If you're using it a company you, when you begin paying for it and then you get a lot of other uh, yeah get even more options and support and so on but it is one of the old, one of the older ones as you can see it's original from 2008 so they've been around for a long time and I did use that but then at some point I, know I uh, came to the, came to the realization that I personally don't Personally, I don't really need someone to manage it for me. I can just, I can just use a regular, a regular old auto post once in a while, and I, do, I, per, I personally don't need the, the statistics and this, the, yeah, the advanced statistic options those services like this one offers. But do, I mean, my needs does not necessarily fit everyone's needs. But do think, do you need to have a third party to manage it for you, or do you? Because I mean, everything, every every time you're using, you're basically you are disclosing your creden credentials to another party. You at another risk of getting attacked or getting your website, getting getting your account hacked because some then someone else do have access to your stuff. And so that's. But then again, I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, security minded. So for me, it was not worth the risk having someone else having access to my stuff, but. I do see there's a lot of uh, potential, there's a lot of uh, added value for using such a service if you need it. Yeah, Snapchat, maybe not as much as directly for a website such as WordPress, but do, but do, do remember a lot of young people use Snapchat, which is why if you're targeting a young audience, Try to make a make a try to yeah get into that and get into get an account that's popular and get your word spread. That's for example why we had and uh, can't remember if they're using it anymore, but they at least they used to have an, a Snapchat account for Inno event for example and a Snapchat account for actually for EA on two. Hmm. I'm not certain how many uses it, but it is we we they made it because it is among certain audiences Snapchat is the is very popular platform for getting news about stuff. So that's also an option. And of course, Pinterest, basically an online pin board, but again, especially among the arts and crafts crowd, Pinterest is extremely popular. So if you are making so, and company, companies have discovered that. So companies use, for example, selling yarn or other stuff, they are actually actively using Pinterest to put to pin them when they put an article about knitting up on their website, they they put a pin of that article to onto Pinterest. So if people search for yarn on Pinterest, they might get there get a link to that company's article about knitting, and then in turn go on to buy some yarn from that company. So if you so certain for certain amount certain user groups, Pinterest is very important because a lot of people do search about for for example search for inspiration on the Art and Crafts project on Pinterest. There's a lot of other uses of Pinterest too. It's basically just an online pin board. Online pin board. I just personally noticed that among the Art and Crafts crowd, it's very big. I know that for a fact too, actually. So among certain crowds and certain subjects, Pinterest is a very good place to be because people search for inspiration there. So if you have some content that in some way can inspire people or relate to something that people would read more upon, get it onto Pinterest. Yeah. And of course, like I said, yeah, I'll put a link to the Hootsuite too. The last network I'm going to touch upon, it's not really a social network. And it's not that popular in Denmark, I think. Really depends on your market, it really depends on the age group and uh, the target audience again. But Reddit is the biggest online forum. Again, there's a lot of people writing here. So, maybe if their audience, which is mainly young males, will get to have a slight talk about target audiences in a moment. So if you, if you fit with that target audience, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to make, account, make an account of Reddit, be active there, 
And then while you're active there, sneak in links to your website project. And that's also a kind of network to be at and be active in because they does have a lot of users, quite a few millions a day. Yeah. Well, yes, there's just a short point about Pinterest. You can actually also embed Pinterest pin bots on your WordPress site. Very easily, you don't. You can either use a plugin, or you can actually just. If you aren't scared about a slight bit of code, you can get the code from Pinterest and embed that Pinterest pin board on your WordPress post directly. Plugins, of course, and using a plugin, of course, adds a few more options and make it a lot easier. But it's very easy to add a Pinterest pin board to your website. So again, that's a different way. Then you can say you basically come, come we may become full circle because you can pin stuff from your website on Pinterest and you can and you can also put Pinterest on your website. But that's an all, another way to use it. Yeah. I'm going to put this article along with the along with the along with the video for today. But in general there's a lot of statistics about it. This one is relatively new and seems rather credible, that's why I'm using it as a source. They are a lot of people using social media, if you wouldn't, if there should be any doubt about it. 2.8 billion people are on some kind of social media. Then again, I'm pretty sure that 800 million of those are using Baidu, which is a social network that none of you probably ever know about, because that's mainly used in China. <laughs> but pretty much not, not available outside of time, China. But it was interesting basically because it's uh, everything. Take Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Basically take all social networks, add in, uh, add in Uber and a lot of other, and Uber and a few other services, and then you have Baidu. Basically all the popular websites in the West roll them on into one bottle and you have this Chinese social network Baidu. You can order food Baidu, uh, using Baidu. You can pay, pay using Baidu using your Baidu account. So it's a kind of super network, but it's only used it's only used in China, so. But then again, they aren't allowed to, allowed to use Facebook and Twitter, so of course they made their own. Yeah. And then there's more and more using social media. This article says it's about 22% more than last year. Usage goes only one way. So go get your website spread on the network, mostly fitting your target audience. Of course, Facebook's the most most popular ones. I wonder if they're going to have a big party when they're hitting two billion users. That should be in within the next couple of months. So they're getting, Facebook is, is of course the most used one. What surprised me is like it is actually that Facebook is mainly used by females. 83%, men only 75%. 83% of online women use Facebook, 75% of online men use, yeah, use Facebook. So Facebook has a slight uh, skew toward, like, toward the female audience. And I, like I said, the teenagers, the very young people, they moved on, they, they use Snapchat and others. They are basically moving on from Facebook by now because Facebook, that's what we old people use. At least in the eyes of teens, we are old. Of course, they, have, they probably have a Facebook account just because you, you have one, but that's not the main one. But it's to reach, to, to reach millennials or Generation X, basically use people who are around 30, Facebook is the best way to get to them. Like I said, so Facebook is good. YouTube, actually one billion, uh, you one billion people use, face, use uh, YouTube a month. There are a lot of people watching videos. There's a slight school towards men using, uh, using YouTube. Instagram, females again, which strangely fits very much with my with the uh, uh, with uh, yeah my per my personal network. And that thing, I don't think my my female friends are a lot more active on Insta Instagram than male friends. 
that fits with the statistics. And Twitter. Yeah, mainly male. So, but I'm going to I'm going to post this on the long chat so you can read up on those statistics yourself. Oh yeah, Pinterest. That's again very much female. Forty five percent female, seventy percent male. But then again, I want to fit this my note I'm I have a lot of friends who share sewing patterns on Facebook and really much like sewing patterns on uh, Pinterest and similar. And that's to be not to be sexist, but yeah, that is mainly female. Females so do share that. That's an area where it's used a lot, apparently. So I'm going to post this because it's interesting. Because do a little market research, find what network is the most most used by your target audience, and then you can use plugins to connect it to your website. What plugins you want to use? Well, there's a lot. Look for those who have been updated most recently. That's the general thing about plugins. Try to find the newest updated ones. That means they are up to date, both from a functionality point of view, but especially from a security point of view. But if you are using a lot of networks on your website, consider would a service such as Hootsuite or a similar be worth the added, yeah, well, the added time to set it up and the added maybe cost. That was a brief, like a brief talk about social, social media. Last couple of times we talked about a lot about WordPress sites and setting stuff up and plugins. What good plug and good plugins. That's why I figured I'm going to take one of my websites that do when you're done, actually had this to make for quite a while, but did just had it lying around. So if you get install the WordPress on it, and then go through setting up some of those plugins I've talked about in the last couple of, yeah, basically mainly last week and this week. So this is a website, obviously running a WordPress. And if you go to the control panel, excuse, I excuse that's a bit in Danish. You can see it's a very, it's pretty much a bare bone WordPress that's so Only thing I've done is changing, change the theme, change the theme so far. So w one thing that would be maybe could be nice to add to the website. Talked a bit about last time having the option to add a plugin, so we. So I'm going to want to add a plugin so we can change the language of that website, for example. So if we go to plugins, add new. That was one of the translation plugins I mentioned. There's a lot of others. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah. Good. While that installs, I'm just going to, it's already installed. We love having a rather fast web server. If you install this one, Qtranslate X, you of course get a startup guide. I have already done it. I don't want to see the, it. that's the thing about plugins. You often when you add plugins, they have the tendency to show this kind of bars and top wind. Thank, thank you for using our here's a tutorial on how to use our plugin and so on and so forth. Which can be a bit annoying if you have used it before. Now you can just have to click on the way. See this website so far I just installed QTranslate X and a Kismet like I mentioned the last time, it's pretty much a given that you're going to want to use that if you have comments enabled. And it actually comes bundled with WordPress nowadays. Well, if you notice, it's made by automatic, the same guys who make WordPress. So they bundle that plugin. You don't have to use it. You can just deactivate it if you don't. And then of course, if it's, if you deactivate a plugin, da, 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 
like that. You can always delete it. I'm going to activate it. Though. And then you need for you to use a kismet. We'll just take that before Q transit X. You do need an active Akismet uh, an active Akismet account. Again, it's basically because like I said Akismet is collecting I said last time, Akismet is collecting uh, well sending uh, collecting spam and basically so it can help categorize spam for others. Luckily if you have a WordPress.com account you can just use that. It's free so on. So if you've gone, uh, if you once you've acti activated a kismet, you would get. Yeah, you can just click there, get your get your API key, and then it will do everything for you. If you follow that guy, if you have an API key stored from from yeah from a backup or from another from a pro another project you're not using anymore, you can just use it there, put it in there, and then connect it. So here I have a key, I'm saying connect. It takes a slight bit, slight while. And then it's set up. And then you have a few options. Yeah, but general, a kismet is very easy to use and very much recommended. But what I wanted to show you was the translation plugins plugin. One of them, QTranslateX. When you install that, you pay and go to the settings page. You basically see this one. Uh, general, it's it's the option of English. Somewhat reason it missed that Denmark has the Danish flag. And of course, you need to set this up. Now the interesting thing you see actually it supports a ton of languages. But the interesting thing is if you go to You can basically change how it looks. For example, you can say if you want your website, the one, the first one is crib. So basically, after the, the URL here, up here it will say slash lang equals en. Not recommended. It's not very friendly so for SEO. The one, I, the one I tend to use is also the one they recommend. That's pretty nice. That's just uh, slash en. Just to show the point. It has integrated. So we so I say English. Go to a post. You notice the URL. It says slash e before the name of the post before the data name of the post.
and then you can set it to hide the language information if there's if you for example if you have your website and your website has a main language for example Danish like my website here does then it would be no it would be a bit silly if every post said animegan.dk slash da slash date and so on so you can set it to hide that for the main language you can also set it up to hide content which is not available in the selected language Basically, that means if you, for example, have a post that's only available in English and people try to access it from the Danish website, then currently it would be uh, if you don't, if you haven't this one ticked, they would just say, for example, they click on the title and they will say this post is not available in, da in, in Danish. If you tick this one, people who are using the browser from the website in Danish won't see it at all. And then the last one here, of course, you can show the content in an, in, an, in an alternative language when the select is not available. Again, I would not necessarily recommend that because if I'm browsing a website in English and suddenly I get a post in Danish, I would be, I would be a bit freaked out and find it strange. And there's a few tutorials on how to do stuff. Creation and deal from Gentic Rate, but I want less than link to the link. Okay. I'll just show on the web on the website because here I have it running and set up with a menu. And to be honest, I can't remember the short code for it. So now you set this plugin up, and there's a tutorial and guides to it everywhere. So if we go to menus, okay, we want like a new menu. This website, so new it doesn't even have a menu. Yeah. Whatever, it's called something. Just show the sub page cost. And then we want to add, oh, there's an option of adding a language menu. Yeah, I want to add to add a language menu to my menu. I did forget to put the menu in a location of my theme. So let's say the, the menu I just made with the language which would be in the menu. And if you go back to the website then, you will see now there's an option on the menu to switch language. Of course, I don't really have any content since this is being a demo site. But you can see it's not that hard to add more content and add the option to have your website in several languages. If we now want to make a new post, you'll see we have the post we can write the post content of the post both in Danish and in English. So that's e so it's easy to add, and there's a, lo a lot of other options. But you can easily add the option to have your website in several languages, like I mentioned last time. One thing is having a website in one language. But you might have noticed. Probably both on your own, web, on your maybe on both of your own web, WordPress sites and on other sites, that you may you may might have your website in Danish and menus in Danish and all that, but your theme. There's a good chance your theme you're using on your website, for example, is not made by a Dane. So there might be snippets of English still showing through on your website because there's some things, then some stuff, uh, written on your web page automatically by the theme. Luckily, well, there's not an app for that because in WordPress it's called plugins, but yes, there's a plugin for that. Actually, zero, but local translate is one of the e easiest ones. What local trans translate does is basically have a, giving you the option to translate all the text in plugin chips installed on your website and all the text in themes in you installed on your website. So, let's just activate it. 
so you can see how it's done so if you go to you can see well, there's now an option in the menu called local translate and then you can see which active which themes do you have and which plugins do you have yeah this theme I'll go click on it I want my to translate my theme to Danish oh there's no translation shared I'll make a new translation I want to be to be in Danish and yeah I'll just put it there and then you can see basically all the text text from the theme so if you go to the front page come on internet you can see it says home here in the middle because it's the home page let's translate that and you can see on source text it says home so we want to translate that to Danish to say yeah then we'll save it. Oof. I'm now translated 1% of all text in the theme. You need to make, make maybe change a few other settings, but basically what Logo does is allowing you to lay to add translation files to any themes and plugins on your website. And that's nice. Some plugins already come with a translation. For example, WooCommerce is available in Danish, so if you have a website running Danish and you install WooCommerce, everything in WooCommerce should be in Danish. But what pe what actually has been uh, because other people have been have translated it for you. But if you end up using a theme or plugin that someone that other people haven't translated, then local translate can help you do that. So definitely recommended to get a cohesive look on your website in one language. Mm. I mentioned Jetpack last time as the big more or less super plugin. Let's try adding it. And setting it up also because it has also has a social media posting feature so basically you don't need if you are using jetpack anyway i don't want some more advanced specific features you can actually just use jetpack to propagate your posts across okay not as many as the dedicated plugins but across quite a variety of uh, websites so I'm just going to connect it to the wordpress.com to my wordpress com account come on yep let it uh, already have an account I don't need a new one come on I'm going to show it on a, on a different website, but the main thing is the, is the same. Once you've got it connected to a Jetpack account, you'll basically get this spot in the menu called Jetpack. Let's see if you can't get it to load properly and load all details. Jetpack also has another layer of statistics for your website, so you can see how many visitors you have. Again, you can of course you of course you can of course use services like Google Analytics and similar. Actually, if you really care about statistics on your web on your website, I suggest using different services because they 
got visitors rather differently. Just to show you what I mean, you can see here. I have a third plugin for statistics. So you can see the Jetpack one up here. It says I had about 1863 visitors yesterday. This other plugin said I had 312 visitors yesterday. <laughs> and then there's Google Analytics, Analytics. what did they say? Oh, they are actually pretty, I pretty agree with Jetpack for once. They say 63. On the same day, you can, depending on which statistics service, statistics service you use, there might be a difference of several hundred, if not even thousand, between how they, because they, they count with visitors differently. And especially Google it do, in my opinion, count visitors in a rather problematic way. Because how many of you use an ad blogger to block tracking cookies, for example, from Google's ads? ads? Yeah, well, you don't count as visitors by Google statistics. Google Analytics ignore people who don't have Google, Google cookies on their computer. So if you're using an app blogger, Google, you, your statistic knowledge is usually useless because you won't be counted as users of websites that rely on Google Analytics for statistics. Hmm. Which is why I currently don't really recommend Google Analytics because they decided they want that train cookie before counting people as real people. But not all real people want to be tracked by Google. Yeah. Jetpack should count the raw amount of visitors and the other, uh, there's a few others that do. Otherwise you can use uh, the statistics panel on your website to get, that's basically the, that's the most raw, um, raw amount, raw statistics you can get about users because that basically just, that uh, if you go to your web post, you can see how many people visited your website. That's the raw data. That's going to be the highest one. The problem is that the raw amount of visitors also includes bus visiting your website. And at least 60% of all stuff, yeah, all traffic on the net is from bus, not from real humans. That's why, it's good, why, that's why services such as Google, such as Google Analytics are so popular because they, they use patterns to discern the, to discern which people are bots or not. Basically, you can see if, if the same IP, the same IP address visits a thousand websites within an hour, that's probably a bot, not a human, and so on. So they use algorithms to sort out the bots from the search results, so they only get the more legitimate user. So it's, but then again, do you try to do it? Then again, they use one algorithm to sort out what they think are bots. Is that, is that catching the true amount? Is that really the true data? That's why I recommend using several different statistic plugins and use several different statistic services because they, own, they each use their way of trying to sort bots out from the picture to get them out of the picture. Because probably if you use different services, if you like probably, but if you use several services, then the truth is so probably somewhere in between the data if you, yeah. Yeah. Jetpack is just the one. Jetpack has an analytics plugin, and the last one. Let's see if the name is shown here. For, otherwise, I just find it on the plugins. I think I'll just find it on the plugins. That might be faster than. The good thing about both Google Analytics and the other one here. Yeah, VP statistics just. The good thing about that is that it provides quite a few, few other options for statistics. You can see where the visitors are from, in which hours they're using your website and so on. So that's basically a lot like Google Analytics, but not run by Google. 
But then again, I'm not so I'm, I can't guarantee that their that their word on the amount of visitors so there it, that that isn't screwed because that's a, they say the that the website has a lot more visitors than Google. It's an option. I'm pretty sure it does have a lot more web users than uh, what Google shows, but I'm not certain it's uh, five times as many. So that's what you have to say. So that's where you, as a knowledgeable administrator, comes into account. You need to try to sift through the amount of data and then find, then judge where do you think the real value, the real number is. And yeah, it sucks. It's, it sucks that there are so many bots, so we can't really trust raw data. I mean, the easiest one we would, if, would be if you could trust, just trust the raw, the raw data number from before, from our web server. In that case, this website will have around 15,000 visitors a day, at least, between 50 and 60,000. Somehow, I don't, I don't trust that. There's probably a lot of those bots. That's why you use those plugins and those services that try to sift the bots away from statistic numbers. But you, as with all algorithms, which one do you think is the most accurate? I don't know. They keep them secret for a reason, because they don't want people to manipulate the numbers. So that's why, you have, that's why my opinion. I suggest you try to use your capacity to users and then make your own opinion based on the numbers you get. Now we're here on this website. I do recommend, yeah, if you're using the QTranslate X plugin, like I showed you in a moment, there's a plugin for to integrate that with Yoast so you can get a bit more, so you can get, uh, set up SEO options in Yoast for each language individually. That could be pretty neat if you need that. Oh, and an area I haven't touched at all. EU cookie law. You probably noticed a lot of websites when you visit them the first time has a pop-up that says allow cookies for this website. Right? Mm -hmm. For example, try to go if you the first time you go to probably shops like the like, first time you go to shops like El Gigant or Power or Similar, for example, on a new browser or a browser where you cleared your cache. It will say, do you accept cookies? The reason they're doing that is because cookies do allow for tracking people. And per EU law, websites are not allowed to track people. Today they're not allowed to track people. Tomorrow they'll be, they'll be allowed to track people even less. AKA the big shakeup that will happen in May 2018 when the new privacy laws regarding online data in the European countries turn into turn active. That would be interesting. There's a lot happening in there. From May next year it'll be a lot more you'll have your privacy your private data would be a lot more secure and companies would have to pay very bad fines. I'm very much interested in what's going to happen with Google back then actually because they are violating most of the a lot of new laws there. And now, uh, given that uh, given the scope of those laws, actually, they have they would have actually to pay fines that actually can be felt by them up until twenty five million euro or two percent of the annual income of the company. That's going to hurt. That's quite a few billion. Google then would be going to to uh, to over the EU if they continue continue yeah doing what they're doing right now and tracking people left and right. We'll see. Facebook, so Facebook, Facebook basically also violates those laws to in laws in. But we'll see. They have to comply by May next year. May 18 it turn. May May next year will turn into uh, effect those laws. But for now, even for now, you need to have if you, your web page use any kind of cookies, you'll have to have a disclaimer like you so you have a disclaimer popping up the first time a, a user is using a website web page and say that they allow. You, your website to use train cookies, cookies. Then you probably think, well, I don't need that. I don't use actually. I don't use cookies on my website. Well, if your website uses Google Analytics, you are you're basically, you, if you're using the Google Analytics service, your website is going to is going to talk with the Google Analytics cookie. Like I said, Google really like using the cookies to track people around the net. So if you're using Google Analytics. It'll, it'll, it'll work with the Google cookie. So yes, if you use Google Analytics, you need to have a disclaimer on your website saying that blah, 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 by, by allowing this, you are agreeing to the use of this cookie. And if not, you, you, your, 
If not, then people would need to be sent away from your website. If you, but otherwise, you're not following EU law, and you can get fines. Yeah. I'm going to show you right now. For example, in, uh, good that you mention it, it's nice to know actually. For example, if you're using Google Chrome, most, it is the most popular browser. You can do it in Firefox too, but Google Chrome is very easy. Next to your website, the, the URL of the website, you can see there's an I for info. If you click that, how many cookies are, this, are your website using? And then you can see basically there's a list probably a bit hard to see in the back row, but there's a list of, you can see how many cookies the website is using, <laughs> where is it using it, if it's using location services, if it's where the website wants access to your camera, and so and microphone and so on. My simple teaching blog actually uses 81 cookies, mainly because it's integrated with Google. Let's, for fun, try to go to Facebook. next to the Facebook logo. Facebook actually, they're only using 12 cookies. How many, let's see how many. Ah, we'll just go to, instead of Gmail, Gmail we'll just use google.com instead. How many cookies are Google using? Just going to the google.com website. Google.com actually use 35 cookies. <laughs> So the chance that you need to actually tell the user you're using cookies on your website, that's pretty big. Because a lot of services, basically cookies are used, just a small small snippet of information on your computer. For example, if you log into your WordPress and say, save password, well, that password is saved on a cookie on your computer. That's one. Of course, maybe normal users won't need that, so that's one cookie less for them. But yeah, you probably end it's you very easily end up using cookies on your website, which is why I definitely recommend. Well, so far the you there haven't really been that much enforcement of the cook of the of the law about cookies, especially not for small companies or, pri or private persons. But even though an our law is not enforced, you it would be. Well, it's good practice to follow it after all. So I definitely recommend EU Google Law is a very easy, I can show you that it's actually rather easy to use to plug in. Just need to remember, yeah. Settings EU Google Law. Da, 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 da. And then you can see if it's active, add a few other stuff here. Should it disappear if people scroll around your website and so on? You can set a few settings up. Where should it be? In the bottom, in the top, and so on. You have a lot of other options on where to put the cookie, allow cookie pop-up box. And set up the colors and the text and so on. So, yeah. So definitely, the EU cookie law is one of the easiest to use. This, if you if you search for for cookie, yeah, if you just search for cookie in WordPress or just search for cookie law in WordPress, you should get quite a few options for plugins. I'm not saying that this one cookie law was the best one, but there's a, but it is one of the easier to use ones at least. And well, just to be on the safe side, and also that's a good message to your customers that you're aware of current laws about such things as privacy and so on. And like I said. Oh boy, it's going to have, there's going to be a big shakeup on how people they treat uh, people all the online by May next year in the EU. But that's a whole different <laughs> that's a whole different talk. I think we can spend quite a few we can spend quite a few days talking about this differences in privacy laws in next year. That's going to be interesting. 
and a lot of people are going to get very uh, need to get very fast when we cross the new when we cross new year and they realize they have they aren't in compliance with the with the laws or and a lot of people are going to earn a lot of money to help those people get compliant but that's something different i'm just going to show you showing you jetpack that's basically where we came from and then we took a detour like i said the statistics from jetpack that's Again, you don't need jet. It's, it, it would be a waste to install Jetpack just to get this, this statistics module. But you get a lot of small, nice services in Jetpack, so it's a bit like a Swiss Army knife. And that's those are always nice to have in your pocket because they have a lot of tools that can be useful. Yeah, it has a few bit more protection, a bit more protection to your website. It, oh yeah, automatic border company that made a plugin a few years ago and added that plugin's options to Jetpack. So, well, 68,000 malicious attacks on my attacks, they, the extra code from Jetpack could help block. Doesn't mean they would have gotten through anyway, but it does uh, block a few, it does add a bit of extra security to your website too. You can add downtime, moni downtime monitoring for free. You can see there's a few of them that cost money that you need to upgrade to a premium package to get access to, but you don't need them necessarily. Downtime monitoring is free and nice. That basically means if your website goes down, that means basically the WordPress.com is taking, will, will check up on your website very often. And if it goes down, you'll get an email, hey, your web website is down. And then when they, your web host may have, maybe they're rebooting the server, then when, when it gets up again, you'll get an email, hey, your website is up again, it was down for so and so many hours, or minutes or whatever. That's a pretty neat service, at least if you have a mission critical website, because if your website gets down, then you have it. if you get it even when it goes down, then you have a chance of getting in contact with your service provider immediately and say, hey, get my website up and running again. Or at least try and find out why it went down. So downtown monitoring could be a nice option to have. Spam protection. That's uh, Akismet actually. Numbers you're showing. Yeah, 109,000 since it reset, but that's okay. Image performance, that's, you don't really need to do much about that. Yeah. What's interesting here in you have a few options more to add to your CC, but what's interesting, what I was going to show you was sharing. Publicize. Automatically share your post to social networks. Yeah. And then you can say connect to social media accounts. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can't because I can't remember my password right now. That just sucks a bit. But basically, here you can set up and get your WordPress. I think I haven't logged in out of this one yet. I think I can show it here. it wants me to log in your way. Okay, doesn't matter. Anyway, you can connect that to quite a few social networks. Not as many as the dedicated ones, like I said, but they connect it to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, one or two more I'm not using. So you can connect it to quite a few. What it does is basically what you saw on, my, on the Facebook page. Facebook page here, it would, those posts are made by Jetpack. They just, it posts it automatically to your WordPress account. The good thing about using Jetpack for, for auto post is you don't need to go into all the trouble with uh, having a developer account and getting an API key from the developer account, the Facebook developer account and so on. By Jetpack, you just connect it to your regular Facebook Facebook account, say, uh, and then it asks, and then you can see what more, you, uh, like, and then, it, then you can see Either it can post it directly to your wall, or if you manage uh, manage pages, 
like I'm doing here, they can post directly to that page. And the good thing about this, it would be post like you can see here, under the name of the page. It would not, like say, you could fear that if you're connected it to it, using it via your Facebook account, it would post it under my name. But like you, but if you're running Facebook pages, you, know, you probably know you can put you when you put you can uh, when you post to a page, you can uh, you can post as the page itself. In this case, if you're connecting your Jetpack to your Facebook account and page, it would of course post as the page name, not as your personal name. So that's a rather nice nice option in Jetpack. And Jetpack again can also add those sharing buttons I mentioned before. Only, like I said, a limited amount of networks, but the biggest ones in our area. So again, if you have Jetpack, you don't need a separate like, separate plugin unless you def or unless you really need one of those social sharing plugins that support. I think I've, at least I used one once that supported 51 social media platforms. I would not recommend allowing your users, uh, having your users, uh, the option of sharing the post on 51 social media platforms at all, at once. You may, I would suggest you maybe fix, find the three, five most popular ones that fit your users the most. Not allowing, having them share, having a website, having your post here, uh, having the option of sharing it on so many would definitely, uh, well. Definitely be make it uh, half of the use, and then they're just going to drop it because there's so many. Yeah, like button and so on. Yeah, I think that was that was plugin. Yeah, use. We pretty much went through the used last time, so I don't think I need to use that again. So yeah, I think. That was pretty much it today. It for today. I hope you got a few new ideas next time, and will be the last time. And I will talk a bit about how to take a backup of your web. One, the one thing, one of the main things is going to be I'm going to is going to be the security. I'm going to talk a bit more about security and how to secure your site a bit more than it is out of the box. A few plugins and some settings here and there to secure your website talk a bit about how secure, uh, secure passwords and so on, two-factor two authentication and such. So basically on how to secure your website, and then I'm going to talk about how to move your website from one installation to another. For example, if you're making your website on your local computer, then you can use a, have a backup plugin and then take use that plugin or similar to take a backup and then move it on, online to whatever web host. And in that, I'm in a, in that area, also going to talk a slight bit about what web hosts are there here in Denmark currently in the market and which ones are, well, recommended and which ones are so-so. So, that's it for today. Thank you for listening.